um, again, good afternoon. Um, welcome to this breakout session on uh, liability um, of the high level conference on artificial intelligence. Um, I would say that this discussion is timely because the EU is working full speed to develop an ecosystem of trust for artificial intelligence, because in turn, trust will ensure a quick uptake of um, AI technologies. To this end, uh, the EU has crafted a comprehensive agenda on artificial intelligence. And let me uh, just remind you about the white paper on artificial intelligence and the report on safety and liability, which was adopted back in February 2020. Uh, these two strands will culmin have culminated with the first package of legislative measures proposed this year in April, um, namely the Artificial Intelligence Act and the revision of the Machinery Directive. As we all know, Artificial Intelligence Act uh, and sectorial legislation uh, sets out the next anti-safety rules, but still liability rules are a crucial piece of puzzle in cases where damage does uh, occur. And therefore, these legislative measures will be followed by an initiative next year on EU rules to address liability issues related to new technologies, including artificial intelligence systems, for which there are still some questions to be answered. We have to, uh, together with us today, um, carefully chosen and well-balanced panel of experts in liability, voicing out the needs of different actors that may be affected by liability regime. So it's a pleasure to introduce you, Marco Bona, who would be um, the victim's voice if I may. So he is a co-founder of Pan-European Organization of Personal Injury Lawyers. Uh, Marco is a lawyer expert in personal injury litigation, cross-border accident, and European tort law. We have also today with us Ioana Mazilescu. Uh, she will be the regulator's voice. Uh, she's deputy head of unit in the European Commission in the Directorate General for Justice and Consumers in the unit dealing with contract law. Together with us um, is also Eleonora Raineri. She's the voice of academia. She's associate professor of uh, private law at uh, the Università del Piemonte Orientale in Italy and visiting professor of private comparative law at the University Paris Dauphine in France. Uh, she is the author of several publications on product liability published in international law journals. Together with us, we have also Consumer's Voice um, with Ursula Pachl. She's the Deputy Director General of BEUC, uh, the European Consumer Organization that represents 46 independent national consumer associations from 32 European countries. Ms. Pachl leads BEUC's work on digital policy, uh, consumer rights, redress and enforcement. Last but definitely not least, Timothy uh, Globachnik, um, representing the industry's voice. So uh, Timote is director of the research and development at Gorenia. Uh, he's having, um, he's the one actually having hands-on experience with digital emerging technology, uh, being involved into the development of embedded software for white good, uh, good appliances in his company, Gorenia. He was leading the electronics R&D department and took part in the development of company's first own IoT platform. Throughout the session, uh, the audience is encouraged to convey their questions through slido.com uh, under the hashtag AIHLC, so AI High Level Conference. We've noticed that um, already some questions kicked in. Uh, we'll be happy to, to take them at the end of, um, of our discussion with the panelists. Now, I was mention, uh, mentioning earlier the white paper on AI and the accompanying report on safety and liability where the Commission uh, identified potential problems with respect to civil, civil liability rules uh, due to specific properties of certain AI systems, AI systems such as autonomy, opacity, complexity of the value chains, um, connectivity, 
And therefore, I'm throwing the first question to, uh, to our guests today uh, to share their views about these challenges that uh, artificially intelligent uh, present to the liability framework. And um, to this first round of question, I'm turning to um, Ursula for a more uh, consumer-oriented view and to Timothée for a more industry-oriented view uh, on this question. So the floor is yours. Yes, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for having included the consumer voice into this, as you said, uh, very timely discussion. Uh, and I think you already started to, to summarize what is really now specific uh, about AI systems and what are the harms, which actually are a very wide range harm uh, um, of, of which um, consumers um, can be victim to. So that can be the classical thing that you know from product liability and product safety, it can be uh, that AI systems cause uh, harm through accidents and that would be an impact, um, of course, on their safety, uh, on their health, on their property. But we also can imagine that there are harms due to, for example, abuse or misuse of AI systems, manipulation of consumers, impact on their privacy, uh, discriminatory decisions that work out to the detriment of consumers. So we have new areas of damages and we have in particular also immaterial harm uh, that needs to be considered. But what I would say are the two classical problems, the typical problems that we see uh, with these AI systems uh, and, and the problems for consumers resulting therefrom is a, a really steep increase of the asymmetry of information between the businesses and, and the consumers. So, you know, that AI products or AI systems are often also referred to as black, black box systems. So basically consumers have no idea, no clue uh, how uh, these things function, how the products function, and therefore the questions that may arise would be, was the damage now caused by, a, for example, a sensor that wrongly interpreted data or that collected the wrong data? Uh, was it caused by the design of the system, by the design of the software? Was it due to the interaction with another product component? Uh, um, so the features uh, really increase these important asymmetries of information and I would say also asymmetry of market power, so to speak. As you know, this is the classical raison d'etre of consumer protection, that there are these asymmetries between professionals and consumers, but in the case of AI systems and the damage that they can cause, I think there is a steep uh, aggravation of, of this imbalance of powers. And then the second problem I would say typically uh, is the question who? Who is liable in case there is harm caused by AI driven products? Because there is, as we know, many different commercial players involved before such a system can function. So we have manufacturers of products, we have programmers, we have app designers, we have cloud service providers and many others. So how can a consumer identify the party that would be responsible according to the legal framework and would be uh, the one to go to. Well, we know that not only from a theoretical point of view, but also because we have surveyed consumers in nine different countries uh, 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 um, nearly two years ago already, but it was very clear that A, consumers say that AI can be dangerous because machines fail, they realize that, and then they say, well, but probably it's very unclear who is responsible and who to turn to. So let me conclude this first uh, intervention by saying what we see in the current legal protection of consumers is a big legal uncertainty because all these features and all these uh, elements that I tried to describe are not clearly regulated. And as um, consumer advocates know, uh, I'm sure Marco will know that, if consumers don't have clear rights, this means they have no rights. So consumers at the current, uh, in the current situation, we think they really don't have enforceable rights at hand, which would um, enable them to trust that they can be, be compensated and have access to redress when, when th something goes wrong. I'm happy to uh, go into more detail, but I think I'll stop here for the first intervention. Thank you.
Uh, okay, nice welcome also uh, from my side. Um, as yeah, some of you know, Gorin is a white goods manufacturer and uh, also a member of Aplia. Um, today I will try to share um, our thoughts, uh, my thoughts with you uh, regarding the topic of connectivity and artificial intelligence uh, on, on behalf of my uh, company. So uh, what connectivity and artificial intelligence could bring to us uh, so many things. It, it can bring, bring nice, nice things like uh, products become smart. They do some things uh, because, of, because of us. Uh, they, we can implement as a manufacturer some new attractive features into it that simplify our life, the life of end users and so on. Um, also the products can communicate to each other, can learn from the user. Uh, learn his habits uh, and also at the end adopt to use the behavior and this is a kind of yeah what artificial intelligence is doing so learning from from the past uh, improving past experience uh, trying to help a uh, customer or user to to simplify his life but uh, yeah to do that uh, of course there's uh, a lot of things to be done on the level of of the final product uh, First of all, what makes things a bit more complicated is that uh, on the, I would say, old school products that are not connected, uh, uh, they were, these appliances were not connected to the cloud, were not sending any information out of uh, appliance. Now, suddenly we have, um, we have an embedded software, sometimes split into two parts, one part within the same, within the product, a different part within the cloud. Although this is at the end the same embedded software uh, which is needed to um, basically to um, allow the, the product to do what it needs to do. But uh, nevertheless, the complexity with that becomes uh, quite bigger, much bigger. And also um, for us producers, it gets um, a bit more challenging um, to test <clears throat> the whole solution as good as we can to, to try to, to find all the possible problems that might happen on the market and to make products really, uh, really safe, uh, that users will be happy to use it also in the future, not afraid and not be afraid to, to lose data or to, to get hurt or something like this. So this is a, a big challenge for us uh, as a producer how to first do the products in a proper way, in a really safe way. And on the other hand, how to gain trust uh, of our, uh, our consumers, our customers. Um, on the other hand, um, cybersecurity is another story here. You know that uh, um, some technologies that were considered safe in the past are not considered safe anymore. So, um, those systems, those connected systems should also have ability to, I would say, to be updated uh, in time to fix those potential um, uh, yeah, security problems if those should happen. And this is, yeah, I would say another challenge uh, we as producers are, are facing uh, in lately. Yeah. And the last point I would um, point out is, um, uh, really the safety standards, uh, product standards and the safety le legislation should somehow go hand by hand in order to uh, facilitate on one side the, the safety of the product on the other side to gain the trust of the, of the final um, consumer. So maybe this is uh, for the beginning from my side. And uh, yeah, I'm also happy to be a part of this session today. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So um, indeed, as um, it was well mentioned, we um, the, the the commission, at least in the past years, has tried to to ensure a robust ex ante framework, right, for for the safety uh, safety legal framework. You have mentioned um, the legislation, but also standards. However, we are halfway through because uh, we have to solve also the other half of the problem, right? Looking at um, at I would say 
the other side of the coin, which is liability. <laughs> so now, um, so now I'm throwing the the second round of questions um, that uh, and, and trying to focus or seize the opportunity of having around the table so many diverse experts to focus our discussion to solutions. So to be more solution oriented, and more specifically to think about what type of measures or actions are needed at the EU level to let's say close this gap and and. Here I'm turning to uh, to Ms. Eleonora Reineri uh, to um, uh, maybe just a short intro to think about the concept of, of defects, which is central in the product liability directive. Eh? So um, we know that the product is considered defective if it fails to provide the level of safety that a person is entitled to expect. And to this end, I would have uh, two questions for you. Uh, the first one would be what level of safety Safety is a person entitled to expect from an autonomous vehicle that um, responds to, to its environment, right? So it um, actually operates by, by learning, by functioning um, through the input received from, from its environment, or for example, from a robot that self learns while in operation. So that would be the, the first question. And the second question, um, can a producer make use of the development risk defense when um, its self-learning products um, evolve unexpectedly um, or in an expected way? So um, yeah, these are the two questions that, um, yeah, I'm giving you the floor. Thank you, Felicia, for the floor. And thank you for these two very crucial questions. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure I, if I have to, to thank you for this <laughs> because they're very challenging. But and thank you for um, more seriously for giving me the privilege to intervene in this conference. Uh, at first, I have to premise that uh, uh, the opinion I'm, I'm, I'm going to express are intended as my own opinion. I'm not talking on behalf or I do not represent. Anyhow, the expert group on liability and new technology I was a member of. Uh, between this group, of course, we have been discussing a lot about the issues you, um, uh, you are asking me. Uh, I go straight to the, to the point that you assigned me. Um, the application of the product liability directive to AI system as um, present different problems due to the fact in particular uh, that the AI system, as Timothy was explaining, learn constantly and therefore change his behavior to the data received that the system receives from the outside world. And this combination between autonomy and learning give rise to risks that for, of course are not predictable in advance and somehow are unforeseeable. Uh, so the problem is, what do we do with this risk? Why do we allocate the responsibility? Uh, because we know the um, product liability directive has a, has a static approach. Uh, it refers to the defect existing at the time when the product has, has been put into circulation. There are many articles of the directive referring to this very precise moment. And um, in particular, I'm focusing my attention because you asked me on the development risk defense. As we all know, according to the development risk defense, the producer is not liable if he proves that the state of scientific and technologic, technological knowledge at the time when he put the product into circulation was not such as to enable the existence of the defect to be discovered. Uh, even if we adopt a dynamic interpretation of the notion of defect, including such so include also the potentially existing defect at the time when the product has been put into circulation, uh, we all know that the producer, the defender, will raise the development risk defense in any claim brought against him for compensation. So will this increase consistently the litigation and also the litigation cost? So my reason is, what is the rationale of the developing risk defense? As you all know, it's an optional tool that has been provided by the legislator uh, in order to keep safe, as an optional tool, in order to keep safe the producer from 
those risks that are unforeseeable and therefore are not manageable. Um, very, very quickly, very briefly, uh, in summary, the directive with the developer risk defense charge the producer with the strict liability rules for those risks that, although unavoidable, were statistically foreseeable in advance. Let's think about the typical case on a manufacturing defect. Uh, what is the rationale of this liability? It's the following. Because the risk is statistically foreseeable in advance, the producer is able to calculate the total cost of this liability. And therefore, this cost is easily manageable by, by him through an insurance or through a, a proportional increase of the price of the product. This is what we call the management risk approach. At least this is what I intend as management risk approach. Of course, the management risk approach cannot work out when we are talking about unforeseeable risk. And this is the problem. However, I have to observe a, that there is an alternative solution to uh, deal with the cases uh, of damages that were unforeseeable, alternative to the de development risk defense. This alternative solution has been adopted, for instance, in Germany uh, with the law on pharmaceutical products. This law does not accord, does not give the development risk defense to the producer of pharmaceutical products. So he, this producer is responsible also for the collateral effect of the, produ of the, of the pharmaceutical products that were unforeseeable. However, at the same time, this law caps the liability. In this manner, the producer is able to manage this cost because he knows in advance what is the cost, the total cost of this strict, absolute strict liability that is put on his shoulder. Um, this German law has been enacted in 1976. It is still enforced, and I, I don't have the impression that it has unparked the pharmaceutical industry in, Ger in Germany. Uh, this solution will have two, two advantage, advantages. Uh, at first, we'll cut the litigation based on developing risk defense that, as I said at the beginning, is going to be consistent. And, and at, the, at, the, at the same time, it gives an answer, it responds to the need for social solidarity toward the victims that otherwise would have to charge to bear the full cost of the damage that was unavoidable also for them. Let me add just a little remark. I know that the time is almost over. Uh, the German law I'm referring to fix, fixes the same cap for all producers, big or small, regardless of their economic size. I wonder if, in my, following my suggestion, it would not be better to set a cap proportion to the respective market share of each producer or to their benefit, so to make it proportion to the risk that they generate um, in the society, in the collectivity. Um, so to preserve the small and medium enterprise from an unbalanced liability. Unbalanced because it can be too big for small enterprise or at the same time too, too low for the big companies. So I would proportion the cap of this liability. I'm going to the conclusion. Um, last thing, to be clear, my idea is that we should revise, the product liability directive should be revised in order to adapt it to the new technologies and to do these features of the AI system. I was talking just about one suggestion, but there are many different um, problems that have to be faced. My idea is that we need to have one product liability directive for all types of products. I'm not suggesting to have just a specific uh, legal provision for AI system, because this will mean a fragmentation of the law, which is going to be contradictory to the aim of trust and legal certainty that are pursued by uh, European institution. Eventually, this legal um, provision that strike a balance 
as a general principle for all uh, type of products, a balance between the interest of the injured parties and those of the producer. Eventually, this very same legal provision can be complemented with some speci specific uh, regulation for the so-called liability of the operator as suggested by the resolution of the European Union Parliament, but I don't have the time to discuss this now, so maybe later. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for sharing your views. I'm sure there is a lot uh, to discuss further, right? And and to to to, to further collect your views on, on, on the hot topics around liability, including those that you have mentioned. But I want to walk now towards another important concept of the liability regime and to turn to to, to Marco for um, so about the concept of burden of proof. No? So when uh, someone seeks compensation for, for harm caused by artificial intelligence product or service, the person has to prove different things. For example, under the product liability direct, the person has to prove that the product was defective um, and has to prove the causal link with the damage. No? Under the national tort law, the person normally has to identify a person who did something wrong and prove that um, that caused the damage. No? Uh, the commission, uh, the commission's report on safety and liability, um, concluded that the burden of proof could present uh, indeed a serious challenge for victims. And now I'm turning my my question to Marco. How could this be addressed? Hi everybody. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, well, uh, this question uh, is uh, is not uh, answerable in a few minutes, of course, but uh, I will try to give some uh, uh, glimpses uh, from uh, the perspective of uh, somebody who is uh, in, in, uh, involved in, uh, in uh, litigating uh, uh, product liability cases. Uh, now, uh, the issue is that, uh, of course, we are facing uh, uh, new challenges. Uh, I was thinking about uh, uh, really the first uh, uh, very famous case about product liability, which is uh, the uh, Scottish case, Donoghue versus Stevenson. You will all remember this case. And uh, uh, it is the case of the snail and the ginger beer. Uh, when we are talking about artificial intelligence systems and uh, the damages that they can cause, uh, clearly uh, we haven't got uh, the snail and we haven't got uh, the ginger beer. And maybe we will, uh, have some difficulties in also finding out uh, who is the producer of, uh, of, uh, of the product. So uh, there are several issues there that uh, uh, cannot be uh, solved by examining just one specific issue, like for example, the reversal of the burden of proof. Because when you consider the reversal of the burden of proof, you have uh, uh, to uh, insert this issue among uh, other several issues. And uh, uh, so, for example, the uh, notion of the reversal of the burden of proof should be approached by, uh, by examining the notion of a defective product uh, and uh, the notion of uh, put into circulation. So uh, addressing uh, uh, the reversal of the burden of proof uh, involves also the consideration of uh, uh, what we are talking about uh, when uh, somebody is asked to prove that uh, a product was defective. Okay, so uh, it is strictly linked with the notion of defective product. So, uh, but uh, I'm not entering into that uh, discussion because Eleonora just went through it. Uh, now, uh, I think that uh, uh, the suggestion by uh, the, the commission in the report on safety and liability to review uh, the reversal of the burden of proof within the product liability directive is a good suggestion. The real issue is uh, how we can uh, uh, approach uh, this uh, uh, revision. Uh, I will say that uh, uh, we have to keep uh, things uh, simple if uh, we can. And, uh, um, and uh, um, I was reading uh, also uh, the recent proposal by the European Parliament from uh, the 20 October uh, last year uh, about uh, the liability of operators, okay? And uh, uh, they are, uh, uh, the, the European Parliament uh, in this uh, uh, resolution propose uh, uh, a reversal of the burden of proof uh, in relation to the operators of high risk uh, 
uh, systems. Now, uh, the real issue is that then uh, these, uh, the, the rule they propose uh, ends like uh, uh, saying uh, operators should not be held liable if the harm or damage was caused by force majeure, okay? And uh, every time uh, we, uh, we focus uh, on terms, legal expressions like force majeures, uh, we are addressing uh, uh, mm, issues that are very uh, complex and uh, maybe they're going to jeopardize the harmonization of, uh, of, uh, of the rules. So uh, if uh, I have to think about uh, uh, an approach which uh, really goes uh, uh, in the direction of considering the difficulties uh, that uh, uh, artificial intelligence systems are going to put in terms of uh, understanding the causation, of proving causation, uh, and uh, of proving uh, uh, what happened uh, in reality uh, behind uh, the damaging event, uh, then um, I think that the best approach is not uh, making reference uh, to uh, concept like force majeure or uh, other uh, legal categories, but maybe thinking about something which is uh, uh, near to the concept of uh, the implication. So uh, I think that uh, uh, the reverse of the, of the burden of proof should bring uh, uh, a rule whereby uh, the uh, injured party uh, is called to prove uh, that uh, the uh, system uh, was implicated in causing the damage. And then uh, it's up to uh, the producer or uh, other liable parties uh, to prove that uh, uh, there was no implication of uh, the artificial intelligence system. Uh, where uh, we find out about this uh, implication concept, <laughs> this is uh, 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 if uh, we can make a, a very uh, straightforward example, we may think about uh, uh, the uh, road traffic accident liability system in France, uh, where there is the concept of implication. And uh, that uh, is, um, is, is actually working quite well, okay. Uh, it, it, clearly, we are uh, going uh, outside uh, uh, the area of uh, the traditional area of the fault systems. Uh, and uh, this is also the reason why I was saying uh, earlier on that uh, uh, there are several issues that uh, need to be addressed altogether because uh, you cannot uh, just focus on, on, uh, on reversal of the burden of proof because then you have to talk about insurance of uh, of these uh, uh, covering these damages. Okay, so it is uh, uh, when you review uh, such a, uh, when review liability system, uh, you should have a, a very broad scope of the intervention. So you should keep in mind that uh, if you change uh, the burden of proof, then uh, you have to take care of uh, how it is going to affect uh, uh, the uh, insurance coverage of, uh, of the damages and uh, whether you should uh, uh, go into the direction of uh, also uh, social security system uh, or state compensation. For, that, for example, the state compensation that uh, uh, is operating uh, uh, for victims of crimes. Okay, uh, so uh, there are uh, several other considerations to be uh, addressed. Uh, but uh, uh, if you ask me uh, which would be the direction and the solution, uh, it should be uh, based on the concept of implication of the product. Okay. Um, then I fully agree with uh, Eleonora that uh, first of all, uh, this issue should be addressed within uh, uh, the framework of the product liability directive and without uh, uh, making uh, this directive uh, into different pieces. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, we should avoid uh, the fragmentation of the product liability directive. I fully agree with this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're very interesting. Um, and um, well, we pick a lot of food for thought from the discussions for what the commission uh, is going to do next. But now um, I would like to sort of close this tour de table and, and turn now to the um, regulatory side, let's say, of, of this panel. And I'm turning to, to Ioana after having uh, heard the views from, uh, from industry, from consumers, from academia and victims. Um, 
And I'm asking Iwana, um, what regulatory options are being considered by the European Commission? And um, to this end, how could the burden of proof be adapted? Um, and is it only compensation claims against producers and manufacturers that need to be considered? Or very importantly, also against service providers or deployers of artificial intelligence? So Ioana, the floor is yours. Thank you, Felicia. It's uh, good to be here. And uh, obviously this uh, discussion is uh, still for us uh, extremely useful because we are in the process of reflection. So we, I do not have uh, definitive answers for the participants for the simple reasons that the commission is still uh, really working on, on all these issues. And in this context, uh, maybe I'll use the opportunity to advertise a bit the fact that uh, we will launch a public consultation on this topic, uh, probably towards the end of next month. So I hope the participants will remember to put in their calendars and uh, contribute. We will have specific questions on various options. But what we are thinking of at the moment is to follow up with the approach that we announced in the AI white paper. And uh, as Mr. Bona was saying, have a holistic view and try to look at all liability framework. And uh, uh, of course, the producer's liability for uh, defects uh, uh, is important because this is the one harmonized instrument that we have. But in the whole uh, array of liabilities, only one possible uh, route that victims have, because you have, of course, under national law, fault-based claims and you have strict liability. And uh, we should all be aware and recognize that very often a person that suffers a damage would rather go against uh, the immediate, um, uh, let's say, liable person, which very often is the one that operated the product, is the guy who pushed the machine, is the guy that drove the car, it's the one that operated the drone, and only in few cases they would go against the producer of the car, of the robot, of the drone, and so on. Uh, so uh, in the large world of liability, uh, there are many other uh, parties that are involved. And indeed, as Felicia said, we want to look at all the uh, uh, parties involved, service providers of services uh, uh, equipped with AI, operators, developers, yes, producers, users. So we are trying to understand uh, how all of these are affected by AI. And the conclusion so far, as discussed earlier, is that indeed, uh, this technology has, uh, when it has these characteristics of uh, opacity and um, autonomy of behavior, does challenge the core of liability, which is to try to find a person that is liable. And uh, it was, uh, I think, one of the comments in the slide, though, no, uh, we do not have on our agenda to give legal personality to the AI. The AI does not is not a person so you have to end up with a person that is liable either a natural person or a legal person and because of this characteristic of ai it's very difficult the faulty behavior that led to the damage it's usually much more remote in time it's much more complex to identify what it is it and our conclusion is that it amounts practically to a situation where the victim cannot make this proof and how we want to address it. I have a lot of sympathy for uh, what uh, Professor Agneri uh, uh, said and uh, Mr. Bona as well, uh, in terms of clarifying things about the product liability first, because obviously product liability is about much more than AI products. Huh? It's about all products. So uh, first of all, we have to clarify some things about what is a product, which is relevant for everything that is software. And that's our intention to see how best to clarify things like embedded software and whether it's a product or not, because these are questions that have raised uh, uh, in practice. So that's, I think, something that we have to start with. Uh, and then, of course, uh, about this burden of proof, the difficulties are not only for AI. So if you look from a product perspective and the product liability, Complex products such as pharmaceuticals also raise concerns. So if we are going to review the directive, I think the, our intention of the commission is to be holistic when it comes to AI, but to be holistic when it comes to the product liability directive as well, 
in its scope. So these are, I think, elements that we have to consider. Now, how in practice are we going to go about this burden of proof? Uh, it is in the cards, indeed, a reversal uh, or some other form of alleviation of the burden of proof, first of all, uh, when it comes to the directive. Uh, and it is going to be uh, maybe for complex products, as I said, but of course, at the same time, we will have to uh, look into all these other elements that Mr. Bona mentioned. Um, that are obviously very relevant and the same uh, with Professor Vianieri about the uh, uh, putting on the market, because that, of course, for learning products, this is a very important uh, aspect and the development risk defense. So the regulatory option that's being considered is to limit or adapt the cases when this kind of defense may be used. But we will have to look beyond the product liability because these difficulties of the burden of proof are in all tort type of uh, claims that concern AI. So we are also reflecting the same the parliament did in a way uh, on how to harmonize a reversal of the burden of proof when it comes to uh, victims of AI in other claims. And in that situation, uh, indeed, uh, the idea behind is to not put the burden on the victim to prove how the AI works, the inner workings of the AI. Another element that wasn't mentioned until now, and I think it's uh, very relevant, especially in the context of today's conference, is the relation that we see with the AI Act. Now, uh, the AI Act, as you know, has uh, uh, defined certain terms, has introduced, well, has proposed introducing certain requirements that are uh, relevant also for liability. And our intention is to take this into account and to continue to play with liability the role that it should have in a legal system, because it has obviously a compensatory role, but it also has a prevention role. So liability rules should, uh, the, in the way they are designed, support compliance with AI Act requirements, and therefore, if you want, indeed, uh, create a comprehensive uh, ecosystem of trust. So for example, if you fail to comply with requirements under the AI Act or with safety requirements, then a reversal of the burden of proof could indeed play a role. So this is one of the things that we are uh, considering when it comes to uh, the reversal. Another element of liability, as I mentioned before, is obviously the strict liability in general, where member states have very diverse regimes with different scopes and different conditions. And here, if we are going to do something, it's gonna be very limited. It's gonna be uh, harmonizing only uh, possible elements for a small category of cases where values such as life, health, or property are at stake, and where we think that especially third-party victims might uh, need more protection. Uh, yes, I saw that there was indeed a question in the slide as well. Of course, the Parliament resolution uh, is something that we look into. It's part of our, if you want, institutional obligation, uh, but uh, the Commission is still assessing all options uh, on the table. So I think from my side, it is all I can say at the moment, but uh, willing to discuss further, of course. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ioana. Um, I will pick two elements from, from your intervention. First, just to seize the opportunity to pass on an information uh, since product liability has been mentioned a few times. Um, only for information that uh, there is a targeted consultation going on uh, right now until, until next month. Um, and in Slido, um, you'll, uh, you'll get um, the link where anyone uh, from the audience, uh, or even you can contribute with um, with your questions, with your answers to the questions that we have raised. And then Johan also mentioned um, a link between burden of proof um, and pharmaceutical products. Um, and I br I'm bridging this with uh, what um, Eleonora has said earlier related to the example of Germans, uh, Germany's pharmaceutical law, uh, which was interesting. And I'm throwing your question here. Um, if you think that the solution should should be applied to all products uh, to avoid fragmentation or only to some products like pharmaceutical, the example that you gave in Germany or uh, specific only to AI products? Okay, um, as I said before, I 
I believe it's better to have one rule, one legal provision for all kind of problem, uh, products without fragmentations. The thing is, I'm not sure that the reversal of the burden of proof will be um, enough and measures sufficient to solve the problem of access to justice that has been raised by Ursula and that we all know uh, there's a problem of access to justice. Why it's not enough? For, of course, there is a problem of asymmetry of information that might be solved with the reversal of the burden of proof. But there is also a cost of uh, proof. Uh, and you know that the more the product is complex, the more we need expertise that are very, very expensive. Uh, the expertise uh, can have a price which is not affordable for the single victim. And even although we, we have a reversal of the burden of, of proof, this doesn't make the uh, claimant free from the uh, burden to pay his own expertise in order to respond to um, what has been said by the defendant. So this increase of price for me is a problem that impair access to justice. The legal, um, the Italian law implementing the, transposing the directive has a peculiar legal provision, which is the following. Whenever it is likely that the defendant defect has been caused by the product, then the judge might ask the defendant, the producer, to anticipate, to pay in advance, the cost of the expertise of the claimant. I unfortunately don't have any data about the impact of this legal provision, but it seems to me something interesting in order to solve the problems we're talking about, of asymmetry information, access to justice, cost of the evidence and of the expertise. Thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you. I'm just um, looking at the time, which is flying really very fast and still I have so many questions <laughs> um, on my list to address. So I will have to make some, some choices, unfortunately. So um, I'm, I'm turning to, um, to Timote for hoping for a quick answer on, on a question I would say uh, quite complex because you have mentioned that the risk cyber risks um, are evolving. Uh, do you think it is important that producers are made liable for defects that emerge after the product is placed on the market? Uh, yes, thank you for <clears throat> for the word. Um, yeah, as I said before, for this cyber security is really a complex part and it changes through the through the um, through the time, um, my opinion is, and yeah, I'm maybe talking in the name of, of my company now, is that uh, for the cyber security issues, I would say that if if the uh, the producer can make a proof that uh, at the beginning that he uh, used the I would say the latest state of the art technology and did all the tests all together. Uh, everything what is known by the time when these products were put to the market, then there is then the question whether the liability can, can automatically be put to the to the producer. Because as I said before, also, if there, if at some point in time, then uh, some technology is not considered safe anymore, uh, the producer have an option to update the product over the, I don't know, over the, the communication channel, um, but uh, some users maybe even don't want to do that uh, to, to fix those those holes. So uh, security security issues. So I would say it, it's um, it's not a yeah. It cannot be uh, immediately said that the producer should take the liability. It's something that uh, uh, needs to be yeah looked from different angles. This would be my my answer. Thank you. Uh, and I'm throwing now a question um, that um, can be picked by any of you. Um, what is your view on the liability of social media platforms, which use non-transparent AI algorithms to promote misinformation or hate speech? So the floor is yours. 
who wants to uh, to pick up this one? Uh, may I say something? Please. <laughs> well, uh, I sympathize with what uh, Johanna was saying earlier on, that uh, you have to look at uh, not only the liability of the producer, but uh, also of uh, other, uh, other subjects. And, uh, and uh, I fully agree that, uh, but it was uh, also written down in, uh, in the report made by the commission last year that uh, uh, we should also talk about the liability of operators, for example and uh, uh, the issue raised by the European Parliament of addressing the liability of operators is certainly uh, something that we should take care of. Okay, so um, we, we, we have to expand uh, uh, the scope of our reflections. So we, we, we cannot put everything on the producers. Okay, and also the, uh, the issue of uh, cyber crimes, uh, that is an issue. Uh, because uh, every time you put down a, a strict liability regime or you develop a reversal of the burden of proof in relation to uh, producer, by the way, you have to face uh, that there will be also uh, a defense saying, well, some criminals uh, came and, uh, and uh, intentionally uh, broke up uh, and, and caused damage. So uh, there will be all, always a defense of that kind. But uh, here, for example, we are addressing the issue of crimes. And uh, we also should think about, uh, as I was saying earlier, on uh, about uh, expanding maybe the liability, uh, well, uh, the, the, the compensation uh, uh, for the victims of crimes uh, to these uh, new situations, okay? Uh, so we shouldn't forget uh, about uh, the directive uh, from 2004, uh, the number 80. Uh, which is uh, extremely relevant. Uh, and there, I think that uh, there are also that in, there is an interesting uh, judgment by the Court of Justice that emphasizes the need uh, of expanding the protection of the victims, also in terms of uh, covering non-pecuniary losses. You know? So it's, uh, it's, uh, we should look also in that direction. I mean, uh, the state uh, uh, should make uh, their own parts, of course, uh, on the other end, uh, we shouldn't make uh, the state pain uh, for uh, the fault of operators uh, or uh, uh, or uh, uh, producer that are not, uh, uh, let's say, planning their products uh, for the future. Okay, so uh, I mean, every time we speak about uh, state compensation, we should avoid uh, putting uh, on the state the price of the fault of somebody else. Okay, uh, but uh, we cannot avoid uh, the issue of state compensation, especially for cyber security crimes. Very interesting. Thank you very much to you all. Very interesting discussion. Um, into this very limited time, short time frame, I will just speak before closing a few elements that um, we have um, just, to, just to live with them uh, after this session. Um, we've discussed about the burden of proof and reversal of burden of proof where the views are, uh, let's say, not aligned, right? And uh, uh, Marco has mentioned um, how this may affect insurance and, and state compensation that we have to think about it uh, carefully when, when we are considering. You have also mentioned about the concept of uh, implications of products that um, probably the regulator, as we, the regulator, we have to look in, into. Uh, very important um, not to look only at the producers, but also to the in, into the other actors in, in the supply chain the life cycle of the, of the AI products that uh, could be held liable. Uh, so I want to thank you very much all. Um, it's a very uh, quick wrap up, but I've been told that we have to finish exactly now so many thanks to you all and um i suggest anyhow we are going to continue this uh, this discussion open in the context of the revision of product liability and other measures that the commission uh, is going to pursue on the liability front many thanks to you all and i wish you a nice afternoon Bye.